put in. That means 400 guys were casualties in this one company. Yeah. And how many of them died, I have no idea, but, you know, typically there's about two-thirds uh, are wounded and one-third is killed. So you figure out the, the math. Anyways, uh, when he got into the, the unit, bombs are going off and everything else, and he's just thrown in. He doesn't know anybody, and he's a, 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 a lieutenant. Um, a 90 day wonder they called them they put them through training for 90 days and said okay go out there and lead the troops and uh, so when he got there he didn't have all his, his equipment so he went to the company commander and said I don't have this and this and this and this and the company commander said well if you survive a week I'll make sure you get it <laughs> what, what, what? <laughs> If I survive a week. That guy went all the way through the rest of the war. And he ate K-rations the rest of the war. And he could not eat normal food when they finally got out of combat. He couldn't eat normal food because K-rations are not normal food. They're not. They're processed cheese and processed this and that. But, you know, I always think about that sometimes when people come into this church and and it's like, well, you know, I think, I think that through my head. I don't tell them that, but I think that through my head. If you survive, you know, if you survive here for a month, then we'll, we'll see what's going on because I've had too many people come in here and they say, man, the warfare is thick or not even be aware of the warfare and all of a sudden turn on the church and say something's wrong in the church and it's like no nothing wrong in the church there's spiritual warfare here it's just a reality you know and uh, um, so it takes discernment to know if somebody's demonic there are there are certain things that are manifest there's other things that aren't manifest. And I don't have a whole list of all those things, but I know rebellion is the first thing. Blaspheming God and rebellion against God is one of the number one manifestations of demonic activity. It is. It was with me. And I've seen it multiple times and uh, it manifests itself in sexual behavior. Uh, look at our society. Billy, or Franklin Graham today came out and said that America has opened itself up to every demon from hell to come into this country. I don't, I don't often listen to Franklin Graham, but that one was true. It's right on the mark. There's a guy that's a born-again believer that uh, uh, Bill Koenig, he, has a, uh, he was a White House correspondent for years. Um, he runs a blog. He speaks at different conferences. And, and uh, somebody asked him at one of these conferences that what he thought, because he lives in, uh, in the D.C. area. And they asked him what he thought about where Washington, D.C. was uh, since, you know, the change of the administration and all that stuff. And he said, blatantly, he said it's organized demonic activity. That's what he said. That was in the first couple of months. So... Um, Um, here's the issue for us do we have demonic activity going on around us absolutely we do um, and it will manifest itself here and there and we go well I'm going to just throw up my hands because there's nothing I can do about it that's not true that's not true 
No, I may not be like Jesus where I can walk up and say, demon be gone. I don't have that kind of authority. I probably don't have that kind of holiness. But believe it or not, the A-team didn't either. Mark 9, 28, 29. When he had come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Now, if you remember, they were sent out as 12, and they were sent out as 70, and they were given power over demonic activity. In fact, they came back and said, even demons are subject to us. There was a power given to these guys, but it was only temporary. So later they thought, oh, well, you know, all demons will be, no, not so. Uh, God withdrew that power from them so they could learn, so they could grow, so they could be humble, because what they did is they got proud, they got arrogant. Um, so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. That's pretty straightforward. We're not very patient. We're not very persevering. And I'm talking about the church in general. I'm not talking about you personally, but I'm just saying. We're not very... And when it hits home with you, which it has for Karen and I and our family, when it hits home, you start getting serious about your prayers. And you start praying a lot. And uh, God will answer those prayers, but it's not immediate. And we want all the immediacy. We want to look at the Bible and say, well, you know, it didn't happen like 7-Eleven, Jack in the Box. No, it doesn't happen like that because we're not as holy as we should be. And I'm not trying to upbraid you or condemn you I'm just saying we're just not set apart like that for the Lord we may be going there we may be getting there but we're not there yet I'm not there yet and I hear people pray for people and do the hocus pocus dominocus stuff and and uh, you know and that's that's fine you know if God gave them faith to believe that but uh you know, it's the authority. It's the authority that we need. It's not the words that we use. It's the authority that we have. Jesus had authority. This demon says, oh my, have you come to judge us? You see, a whole bunch of other demons have been judged already. Did you know that? They've already been reserved for judgment. The book of Jude tells us about those demons. They did not keep their proper habitation. And that is in Genesis chapter 6. Very clearly, it is where demons manifested themselves as men, cohabitated with women, and God judged the 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 world at that point in time except for Noah and his uh, his family and that's hard for people to palate how could demons do that well they're always in a masculine form whenever they're spoken of in the Bible they're always masculine there's no feminine angel sorry that doesn't mean God's prejudice there's just no feminine angels they're all masculine when they manifest themselves, they manifest themselves as what? Men. As men. And so these demonic um, people uh, or demonic activity came down to pollute the human race. And they did a very effective job. And God stepped in and stopped them. That's why he destroyed the whole earth. That's why Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord and all that stuff. You can read it. You can go to Jude and Second Peter. It talks about it. Going after strange flesh. 
It puts it into context that it was sexual behavior. Sexual behavior. And so you can, you can run with that on your own. So it says um, uh, that these demons understand who Jesus is. We know who you are. You're Jesus of Nazareth. And then they proclaim, actually, that he's the Holy One of God. And they fear being judged before the time. They know their judgment is coming. They do. In fact, the book of James says the demons have their hair stand up on the back of their head when they consider their future, when they consider dealing with God. And you'd say, well, why don't they surrender? Because they can't. They can't. They have nowhere to surrender. They have no redemption. They have to fight the fight to the end. That's why Satan will do what he does to the end. That's why what we see is what we see. You know, there's a lot of things that are explained behind that, that he has one shot. He has one shot. That's wipe out the Jews. He has one opportunity. If he wipes out the Jews and there's nobody to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We get to go to heaven, but we can't come back. Because Jesus can't come until there's the Jewish people that cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So you wonder why the, the last uh, Holocaust, that's what it's about. If they can wipe out all the Jews, and this is speculation, obviously, because it doesn't actually tell us this, but it's speculation. If they wipe out the Jews, then there is no nation for him to come back for. There's a lot of Jews that are going to die in the tribulation period. A lot of them. A lot of them. So, so they have a question, and it directly goes to the coming kingdom. So it tells us about their activity, and it tells us about what they actually know. They will continue the fight. They will continue because they hate God and they hate man. And so that's why the battle rages the way that it does. And for those of us who are believers, guess what? We got a big target right on our back, right on our chest, right on our head. And Satan does everything he can to keep us from rising to who we are in Jesus Christ. He does it. He does it. So, the demons know their doom. In fact, it tells us in the book of uh, Revelation that Satan knows that his time is short. He knows what's coming. But he has one opportunity. He's evil genius. He is. Um, but uh, so as Jesus deals with these demons, he just speaks to them and says, hit the road, Jack. And they have to. They have no authority over Jesus. And this is where I say the church is weak, anemic. We're anemic. You know, we could have somebody right in front of us that has demonic activity, but we don't know what to do. So we send them to the psychiatrist, and, the, and we give them all these drugs, which makes them far worse. Because now they're up and down and in and out. Now they're listening to the voices because it's just like a megaphone right in their ear. And it brings them into greater demonic bondage. It does. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over and over again. Do you actually believe the pharmaceutical companies? After all that we have seen, do you believe them? But we've been believing them. We've been believing Dr. Welby and Dr. Hootie and Dr. Whoever, right? 
Dr. Fauci and Dr. This and Dr. That, and now we find out that people are going to be able to sue the federal government for this vax that's not a vax and the whole thing. I mean, it's, I'm just telling you. Why would believe we believe a federal government that is hijacked and has been for so long? The FBI covers up everything. The Durham report, oh, it may shed a little bit of light here and there, but I mean, the, I mean, they brought the interview of uh, the, the guys from the FBI in and they basically told Durham and his staff, we're not gonna answer no questions. And he had subpoena power and he had power over them and they should have had to say something, but they said, sue us. See if you can get away with it. That's where we live. That's where we live. So, Again, am I trying to scare you? No, God sits on the throne. You need to read Psalm 2 at least once a week. He sits on the throne. He's going to hold them in derision. He's going to humble them. And if they don't turn, he's going to destroy them. That's what it says. We don't know the outcome of all things, so I, I don't know, you know, we don't have a crystal ball to know exactly how things are going to go down. But I'm going to trust in Jesus that he's on the throne and he knows what he's doing and he knows what they're doing. He knows where they sleep. He knows where their thrones are. He knows where the dead bodies are. Right? He knows whether the glove fits or whether it doesn't. Right? <laughs> he's got all that information. And he can step in and start destroying people or just bringing people out into the light or he can do a lot of different things. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I can read in the Old Testament and I can read in the New Testament and I can see where God intervenes. At times he just intervenes. And all the things that the evil forces want to do turn sideways and God is victorious. I mean, you might want to do a little bit of a study. Go, you, I think you might be able to find it on Google still, but uh, find out about how you got your translation of the Bible and how the powers that be fought and fought and fought and fought not for you to have a translation of the Bible. And even when they got an English translation, the king said, no, you can't read it. <laughs> Good old King James. Uh, you know, because he didn't want people to have freedom. He didn't want them to know. Even though he's the one that put the scholars together to put the Bible together. Anyway, so uh, that gives you a little bit of a, an insight. We will go through this. Now, I'm going to point out one thing. Uh, there is an argument between different scholars or teachers and some say, well, demonic activity was minimized. We just, uh, you know, um, what was written down was basically the, the, the whole, uh, you know, narrative of all the things that he did. I don't believe that one bit. I do not. When it says that the multitudes came and he cast out demons and he healed the sick, I don't believe what these people are saying. I can look out at society right now and say, you guys are got your head in the sand. That's my personal opinion because I've seen enough of it. I've seen it up close and very personal. So I don't, I don't buy into what they are saying. I believe the Gospels themselves only give us a thumbnail sketch of all the things that Jesus did. John told us that. 
If all the books in the world could not contain the knowledge of all the things that Jesus did, how many books were in the world at that point in time? How many books are in the world today? So that I, I just throw that one out. Again, does that mean that there's a demon in every person? No, but there's lots of demonic activity. And there are those who actually find themselves um, under the influence, major influence, and um, satanic activity. I've seen it. We had a girl that was coming to our church that was a lesbian. And, I remember coming into a Bible study we were having in Air Park. And she came in, and she was very dykish, uh, to put it bluntly. And we reached out, you know, trying to win her to the Lord. And, you know, she comes in and sits, and I'm sitting there teaching. And next thing you know, she's sitting in the rocking chair, and she starts humming. And she's humming louder and louder and louder because it was a demon. She had a demon. And that demon was there to distract everybody from the Bible study. So I took a minute and stopped and prayed that God would deal with the demonic activity, and he did. She stopped humming, you know. But, you know, I, I mean, it's... It's one of those, I don't know, odd oddities, if you would have it. Um, so Jesus, obviously, the people, obviously, and this here, the, 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 the other point here is these people knew demonic activity. The people in Galilee knew demonic activity. If you read through, they knew who was possessed. It was manifest. They knew. It was all around them. Again, um, teaching on anything like this is like, some people are like, uh, you're going places where I don't really want to go, and I get it. I do. I understand that. I think I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. Before we moved out here, um, we had a neighbor across the street. His name was Lou. He had a wife named Mary, and Lou loved Jesus. Uh, he had um, loved our kids and uh, older gentleman and uh, ran a tow truck business and uh, went to a, a, a Wesleyan Methodist Church. Uh, that's different than the United Methodist Church. They, they're very different. Anyway, um, he started a home group at his house and there was mainly older people you know, him and Mary were in their probably 80s at that point in time, or certainly late 70s. And most of the people that went there were in that age ca capacity. And he would invite me to come over, and I'm just like, Psh, I'm too busy, Lou. You know, one day I came home from work, and uh, Holy Spirit laid up my heart that I was supposed to go over there. Okay. Well, then the Holy Spirit got me in my back room and had me put my testimony together. I'm like, Lord, this seems a little strange. What the heck am, what the heck am I doing putting my testimony together? I haven't even been invited, <laughs> you know. And so I, I put some scriptures together that went along with my testimony. And so I went over there and... Uh, and Lou had a chair right next to him that he said, Here, you sit right here. He didn't talk to me. He never said a word. 
So I came down and sat with this, this group of people, and uh, he played some spiritual songs. I don't know what they were, but they were not my cup of tea. Uh, like bluegrass worship songs. and I mean, I did my best to just contain myself, but it wasn't my deal. Um, so, you know, it was on a, 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 a turntable, so you could hear the crackling in the background of, you know, the old record. And, and so when they got done with the music, Lou, Lou said, never ever saying a word to me, Lou said, this is my neighbor Dennis, and he's going to share tonight. He never said a word. So I, I shared my background and, you know, a lot of the dark demonic activity I had and, you know, glorified God for the deliverance that I experienced. And, well, there was a lady there in the room. And she was some sort of a leader and she prophesied. She says, God has taken you through all this stuff and God is going to teach you how to fight spiritual warfare. I'm like, okay. Uh, didn't really know what to do with that other than I thought I knew how to fight warfare. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I missed the word there. He's going to teach you. So I had to go get in the middle of the thick of the battle, and that's what he did. And it was horrendous because I had to rethink my whole life around God's word and around what, what, how I was going to fight this, this war, this battle. And God brought me through all that stuff. And so um, I don't know why. I know I can discern spirit sometimes in people. I can know there's demonic activity going on. I don't tell you, because it's not my business to tell you. It's my business to pray. Although there are times when I will get the elders and we will be praying. You know? Um, but, I mean, uh, there's a sister right back here. But how long has it been? Two years? Two years? Two years. Demons manifesting themselves in her dreams and at night and just oppressive, I mean, just constant and using things from her past, I mean, horrendous abuses from her past. And, and, uh, and I watched her get the victory. I gave her a book. Um, and told her, look, you're going to have to read this, you're going to have to pray this, you're going to have to stand on the word of God. You cannot run to somebody else to pray for you. This is your battle, and you're going to have to stand in Jesus. Well, she has been standing in Jesus. She got the victory. I know they still come back, and I told her that. They will come back. They will come back. They always come back. They come back to test, to see what's going on. And I know my wife and I, you know, occasionally, Karen just had some blood work done, and there's this thing in her blood work that shows this horrendous trial. And the lady asked her, she said, what happened so many years ago? And Karen's like, well, that's when we were fighting a spiritual battle, and it was horrendous. And she said, you know, it still hangs over you. And she said, yeah, it does. Every now and then I just think, oh no, no, we could lose him again. And it's like, no, nah, that's a lie. But, you know, I mean, it's your blood work actually can show that kind of stuff. It was amazing. I had a, a blob in there and it had two little horns. She said, what did that look like? So it looks like a demon. She says, well, it is. You got spiritual warfare going on. I said, yeah, I do. It's been going on for quite some time. How could a lady get that out of your blood? Your blood has a record. 
That's what she showed, blood having a record. And then, and then there was some other things in Karen's blood that showed where Christopher was born and his shoulders were so big they couldn't get him out. And he was <laughs> so they had to shove him back in there and it was quite a traumatic delivery for Chris. Um, I'm surprised they didn't get you in there, you know. You were in the canal for quite some time. <laughs> Guess we didn't look hard enough to see, but, you know, I, it, just weird stuff. I mean, I, I would have never thought my blood would have a record of certain things, but it does. Karen was, like, shocked. So... Uh, yeah, as we continue on, it says, uh, verse 36, Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever. To rebuke a fever in this sense is to censor or censure or admonish by implication to forbid straightly to charge to rebuke. And so, uh, as I looked at this, there may have been demonic activity going on to cause her to be sick. I have no idea, but that's the way the rebuke is, is put. And so, he rebukes the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and served them. Immediately! Went from fever to healthy as a horse. <laughs> a pony. <laughs> uh, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Every one of them. Now the Sabbath is over when the sun goes down. That's why they could come. Um, And demons also came out of many, crying out, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked, he rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Why did he not allow them to speak? Because he didn't want the testimony of demons. You don't do that. It's like the girl in, I believe it was Philippi. This man knows the way to God. Well, guess what? Had Paul let her go on, got let her go on, then it would be, oh, well, we can mix and match with uh, the tarot card girl because she's godly too because she's proclaiming the same thing. No, you cannot do that. You don't use the world to give testimony of Jesus Christ. You don't. So this tells us they brought all these people. It doesn't tell us the amount of healing, but it says basically everybody got healed or everybody got delivered or whatever their needs were. Now, I will qualify this with Jesus' ministry was teaching, was proclaiming the word of God. So did that mean he had no compassion? No, I believe he had great compassion. But his ministry was to preach the kingdom, to offer the kingdom to the Jewish nation. That was his job. When they rejected him, then obviously he went to the Gentiles through the apostles. But that was his ministry. Um... Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place, 
And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them, quite different than Nazareth. Nazareth, they tried to run him out and throw him over a cliff. Here in Capernaum, they want him to stay. Stay, stay, please stay. Who wouldn't want him to stay? Um, and he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. So this was his ministry. And um, he obviously is going to confront darkness in many various areas. He's going to go across the Sea of Galilee, Galilee and deal with the guy in the tombs. And one scripture says there's two of them. One says there's one. The guy that just uh, breaks all the chains and, you know, rebukes the demon. And the guy says, can I follow you? And he said, no, go, go home and tell everybody what I've done for you. Um, so, you know, there was a confrontation with the forces of darkness. There was. You know, and we deal with it too. We, it goes on. It goes on. And uh, our God is victorious, but it may take some time. Fasting and prayer. If you don't want to fast and you don't want to pray, then you're never going to see the victory. Probably shouldn't get involved in prayer. But praying and fasting Jesus laid it out. It says, if you'll fast, if you'll pray. So my answer to this is, you know what? It's going to be a long time praying till the victory comes. Jim Cimbala had a daughter that uh, ended up in the dark. He doesn't talk about it quite as graphically as maybe I do. But she was living with a guy. She was pregnant. And, uh, you know, he did everything he could to try to bring his daughter back and pleaded with her and begged her and all these other different things, and she was gone. She was gone. So the Lord finally spoke to him and said, you know what, leave it in my hands. Didn't happen immediately. She wasn't delivered immediately. But he turned it over to the Lord, and one night at one of the prayer meetings they have, the midweek prayer meeting, somebody sent a note back to him and said, I feel very strongly that we need to pray for your daughter tonight. And he's not one necessarily to bring attention to himself, but apparently a lot of people knew about Chrissy. So he, uh, the elder that brought it back to him, he said, oh, okay, well, let's Let's open it up. And he, he said that that prayer session was like a, being in a, a, a delivery room for babies. There was this just outpouring and sobbing and just heart, you know, uh, uh, just given over to the Lord. And one of the things that he said was... Uh, you know, he's, he's just listening to people around him. When, you know, people were saying, S Satan, God's going to knock you out tonight, and you're going to have to let that girl go. And, and they've been praying for quite some time. And uh, so he went home, and he told his wife, he said, Chrissy's delivered. And he said, if you'd have been at the prayer meeting, you would know why. The next day, she shows up, and she falls on the floor, and she's crying. And she asks, Daddy, who was praying for me? Who was praying for me? Who was praying for me last night? And God had hung her over a chasm and said, this is where you're going if you don't turn and repent. 
And so she came home. She now got married to a pastor. They, they, they passed her in Chicago, her husband and her. A Brooklyn Tabernacle in Chicago. I, I, I don't know what the name of the church is, but that's what they're doing. They kept the child and, you know. Yeah. That's prayer. That's prayer. That's when we go to bed. That's when we go to the throne. And again, we don't tell God what to do, but boy, we can join him in what he wants to do, which is deliverance. And so I, I know I left a few minutes here. I'm going to ask you to get with a group of people, two or three of you, and pray for a girl right back there with her mother, Dizzy. And pray for her mother, because the battle is thick. It's intense. It's frustrating. It's... Uh, Nobody can explain all this stuff to you. Demonic activity is not easily explained. But I know that it's real. The manifestations of rebellion and blood and certain things that are going on are manifest. So she's asleep. I think she's asleep or she's hiding it. Um, but we need to pray for her. You know, we pray for people physically, but we need to pray for Desi that God delivers her, that he opens up her eyes to see the darkness for what it is so that she would flee from the darkness and want to be set free because you can't set somebody free if they don't want to be free. You can. not If they want to keep their demons, they'll keep them. So, anyway, I'm going to sit over here, so you can join me if you want to join me.